to my choir is my singer. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today for the second part of Toilet Training Children and Adolescents Diagnosed with Autism Spectrum Disorder. Uh, this presentation today is focusing more specifically on nighttime bowel movement, toilet training, uh, as well as wiping. Um, we are so happy today to have three associate clinical directors from Behavioral Framework with us today. Uh, a big shout out to everybody from Behavioral Framework. They've been a great uh, partner with Pathfinders for Autism all through 2020 and is going into this new year. So I'm very happy to welcome uh, and Tux and Chiara uh, as our speakers. Uh, if everyone could please mute your microphones uh, as well as turn off any cameras and post all of your questions in the chat box. And with that, I am going to turn it over to our speakers today. Thank you so much and uh, have a great workshop. Great, thank you so much, Neil, for that very warm welcome. <clears throat> Again, my colleagues, Tex, Chiara, and myself, collectively have over 30 years of experience working with individuals with autism spectrum disorder from ages two to 22. So we're very excited to be here today to present part two of our toilet training webinar as a guide for parents and practitioners. So let's get started. So we know, and as likely many of you in the audience know, toilet training may occur at a later stage of life for individuals with ASD. Um, and it can be challenging for caregivers and practitioners to teach these skills. So often explicit or systematic instruction is required to acquire, generalize, and maintain these skills. And we're gonna talk about that today. So the, our agenda for today, um, this presentation will be focusing on three main topics, bowel movement training, nighttime toilet training, and teaching hygiene and wiping skills. Skills to be successful and critical components to developing an individualized plan will be reviewed, including various barriers to success and how to address them, as well as some sample protocols. Our objective today is to provide you with tools necessary to create an individualized and effective plan to teach these skills with individuals diagnosed with ASD at any age of life. So what not to expect today? As I mentioned, uh, as Neil mentioned earlier, toilet training for urinations was covered in the first part of this webinar and will not be a focus today. In addition, here are some other skills that we will not specifically be addressing in this presentation, including independence with the overall toileting routine, request for the bathroom, or wiping following urinations for females. These are all important. They're just not going to be the focus of today's presentation. The strategies and recommendations provided today can apply to individuals at any age. However, we are not going to be going to be covering specific modifications for teenagers, young adults, or individuals with severe disabilities. Okay, so now let's talk about some prerequisite skills that are going to be essential for all of the, the topics we're going to be covering today. So you want to consider these four main areas which is similar to prerequisite skills for toilet training for urinations. Physical and medical concerns should always be considered before starting a toileting intervention. And we recommend consulting the individual's doctor to rule out, address, or plan for any medical concerns. Recognizing the urge to use the bathroom is also an important skill prior to starting nighttime toileting. You wanna consider any challenging behaviors that the individual engages in such as compliance with the toileting routine and transitions to non-preferred activities. It's also important to consider specific aversions, rituals, or toileting related problem behaviors that might come up such as touching feces or urine. We'll also discuss how to plan for these barriers when in developing your intervention. The only critical language skill needed for all of these all of these different skills is the ability to follow simple directions, generally speaking, and the ability to distinguish between or discriminate between two different items or pictures to help with wiping. Being able to request or indicate for the bathroom can also be helpful prior to starting nighttime toileting. In terms of motor skills, being able to follow multi-step routines and using two hands for a task are important, as well as fine motor skills to grasp and manipulate toilet paper to support with wiping. So 
So now moving on to the general sequence of how to teach toileting skills in what order. It could look like this, very sequential, going from urinations to bowel movements, one after the other. However, it could also look like this. It could be staggered. There could be some overlap. The, the main take home point here is really that there's no one size fits all sequence to teaching these skills and they can occur at any stage in life. It's important to consider how you're going to approach this on an individual basis and to be sure that caregivers and implementers have the capacity to effectively implement the protocol, which we'll talk more about later. And with that introduction, now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kiara, who's gonna talk more about bowel movement toilet training. Thank you so much, Louis. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very excited to be talking to you guys today about bowel movement toilet training. So we're gonna go ahead and dive right into our training today. So some criteria. So some criteria that's more specific to bowel movement training that we're gonna want the individual to have is that they're toilet trained. So what does this mean? Is that they can consistently urinate in the toilet and they're having less than four accidents a week across all settings. We're also gonna want that the individual tolerates wearing underwear. Now a note about age. So neurotypically developing children, they begin having bowel movements consistently in the toilet between the ages of three and five. Now this is an average, so it means it could happen before or after, but it does give us a good gauge and an indicator of when it's a good, a good time to get started with bowel movement toilet training. What does success look like? So when an individual is considered bowel trained, it's when they're not having more than two soiled pants per week in both home and school settings. It can also translate into 80% of all opportunities that they're actually avoiding successfully in the toilet. So we're going to have this as a goal, even though the long term goal is going to be 100% with zero accidents. Here's some barriers that we're going to have that we can have to success. So most of the children between the ages of five and eight, they have a bowel movement daily or every other day. So what does this mean? Is that we have limited opportunities. It could be zero opportunities a day to only two. And also an additional barrier is that the training plan hasn't been modified or tailored to that individual. So the intervention should always be flexible. In addition, an inconsistent implementation of the plan. So this could look like every day the schedule is different or we're doing something different every three days. If the individual is engaging in problem behaviors and or sensory seeking behaviors, this could be a potential barrier, especially if they're eloping from the bathroom or they're engaging in some pretty severe repetitive sensory seeking behaviors. In addition to that, if the individual is seeking to avoid in their pull up or they're asking you for the adult diaper, that might be also a barrier to consider. In addition as well, so determining the reason that accidents are continuing to happen. So is it not compliance? Maybe it's an unlearned skill. Is it a medical condition or a ritual and routine? And also including additional steps to that bathroom routine as part of that initial initial training protocol, such as wiping, pulling up their pants, pulling down pants are all going to be things that will present as barriers. Getting started. Okay, so what does bowel movement training look like? So it typically follows, involves following a predetermined schedule and as you can imagine, frequent trips to the bathroom. This schedule is going to be determined by taking some baseline data. So what does data mean? It basically just means taking notes, just writing down notes on a notebook. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. It's going to be most effective if the individual is remaining in underwear. And it's important that the implementer is able to dedicate two to three days to follow the schedule, but not only that, but also be able to observe potential indicators that the individual might have to have a bowel movement. It's important to only begin when we can be consistent, consistent following that intervention. And ideally, all of the individual's caregivers, school, and our daycare can implement the same intervention. Now, something that's gonna be essential is only using this really highly preferred reward just for success, which is having a bowel movement in the toilet. 
something as an edible, which is very easily administered, they can consume it and there's no need to take it away. It's something that you might wanna consider. You can store it in the bathroom, in a container away from reach or somewhere in the home where the individual cannot access it. So success will involve some data collection. Again, taking notes. And this is gonna help us determine our schedule. It's gonna help us determine our intervention and if it's working. In addition, behavioral teaching techniques. And this is what we're gonna talk about today and being consistent. Data collection. So data collection is gonna be a critical component of toilet training. Taking notes is gonna help us determine the schedule and like I said, the intervention. So taking notes on the following is gonna help us figure out when is the individual most likely going to the bathroom. So first we're gonna write down the date and the exact time of all bowel movements. It's also gonna be helpful to indicate if they're doing it after meal time and more or less how long it took them to have that bowel movement after the meal was done. In addition to that, we're gonna write, where is it happening? Are they going to the living room in the corner? Are they going to the bathroom and maybe standing there? Or they maybe wanna do it hidden maybe behind furniture. Yeah, I don't know. Try my company. What the individual was wearing is also gonna be important to note here. So are they wearing their adult diaper? Are they wearing underwear or their pull up, for example? We recommend that you take at least three days of data before establishing that schedule and intervention. So this is what we're gonna refer to as our baseline. So before we do anything. And it doesn't necessarily mean three consecutive days, it means three days of bowel movements. Okay, so now we have data to determine our schedule. Now we're gonna head and figure out our intervention. So typically these accidents continue to happen for the following reasons. The first one is a medical cause, which is really important to rule out. The second is a skill deficit. So this means that it's an unlearned skill. We haven't learned it yet. Maybe we haven't been able, the individual hasn't um, generalized it from urinating in the toilet, from having a bowel movement in the toilet. An additional reason is non-compliance. The individual may be holding their stool, they're avoiding going to the bathroom, and they're just refusing to be in the bathroom at the time of bowel movement. And finally, rituals and routines that surround those bowel movements. Maybe they wanna do it next to the couch, maybe they wanna do it alone in their bedroom or they're insisting on doing it in their adult diaper. So based on the notes that we've taken on their behaviors, based on the notes we've taken about when the bowel movements are happening, now we can go ahead and individualize our protocol determined um, on that data and base it on positive reinforcement. So here's some general individualized protocols that can be modified for any individual across any skill and age. So let's talk about antecedent modifications. So basically this means what happens before the bowel movement. So we're gonna wanna provide a cue for when it's time to have a bowel movement in the bathroom. It could be something like time to go to the bathroom or asking them, do you have to poop? It's gonna, you, you're gonna want it to be different than the urinating cue. Also to consider is proximity to the bathroom at approximate that time that they have to, that they usually go to the bathroom. So maybe going to the basement where there's no bathroom is not the best um, idea when we're doing this training. Also, the advantage of bowel movement is that we can actually observe some of these precursor behaviors that indicate that the individual might have to go to the bathroom. They might be straining, bending over or squatting. So as soon as you see that, it's time to go to the bathroom. So we are gonna rush to the bathroom at that time or at the scheduled time. We're going to assist with the removal of clothing and sitting on the toilet as appropriate for the individual skills. We're gonna provide access to a leisure item while sitting on the toilet. It could be a book, a magazine, a toy, and we're gonna have them sit there for at least two minutes. Now, this is important. This is what we want. So if they, if they avoid, we're going to give them that predetermined, highly, um, preferred item and place them immediately. And then we're gonna assist with getting up as appropriate. We can give verbal instructions or we can assist physically. We're also gonna assist with wiping because we're not gonna focus um, on this training step yet. So what happens if the individual does not void? 
So we're gonna remain neutral. We're not gonna provide access to the reinforcer to so that really highly preferred reward just for voiding. And we're gonna try again in about 10 to 30 minutes. And we're gonna take notes. So on a piece of paper, you can write the time of day with the date and you can write either yes, no, accident, or just like a, a line indicating that there was no voiding. What happens if the individual has an accident? We're also gonna remain neutral and we're gonna provide neutral comments about the behavior. So we can say something like, we'll try again later, we poop in the bathroom, let's clean this up. We're not gonna provide access to that preferred item. And we're gonna implement any predetermined consequence immediately after the accident. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about consequences in a few slides. We're also gonna provide assistance with that cleanup process without providing too much attention. And we're gonna take notes on that accident. So now we're gonna have some specific sample initial protocols based on a skill deficit. So how do we determine a skill deficit? So there's no evidence that the individual is holding their stool. There's no real patterns that we're observing that indicate a ritual or routine around the bowel movement. Therefore, we're gonna get started by prompting the individual to sit on the toilet on a 10 to 30 minute schedule, starting at that time when they're most likely to have that bowel movement. And the data that we took, so those notes that you took for three days, that's gonna help us determine that. So for example, if the individual is usually going to the bathroom between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., you're gonna to wanna to get started about 10 minutes before 11 a.m. and continue that schedule through. We're gonna provide that cue, time to poop, for example, and it's gonna be different than the cue that was provided, that, that is provided for urination. We're gonna consistently provide those clear instructions for all the steps, sit on the toilet, all done, or we're gonna physically assist as appropriate. Now we're gonna deliver that highly preferred reward for those successful bowel movements. It's important, very, very important that we restrict access to this reward at all other times. So it has to be very special and just for this. There's no expectations to wipe, pull down or up pants or wash hands. And we're gonna consider implementing a consequence for accidents. Now here we have a sample initial protocol for non-compliance. So how do we determine this? Now we observe that the individual is holding their stool or avoiding going to the bathroom. Maybe you see them, they're running away from the bathroom and they have to go. And now we can determine it's a possible non-compliance. So our protocol here is gonna look exactly the same as the one we just discussed about skill deficit. The biggest differences are gonna be right here. So we're gonna to want to make that reward very, very powerful. And how do we do that? So we're gonna increase its potency by maybe restricting access to it for at least two weeks before starting that training. It's gonna make it so special for the individual and more motivating. In addition to that, we're gonna consider in this case, utilizing a consequence for accidents. But we're gonna talk about consequences in just a bit. So this is our last sample in Usher protocol, and this one evol involves rituals and routines. So now we're observing that the individual is seeking to avoid at the same time of day every day. Maybe they're insisting on wanting to go on an adult diaper and they'll ask for it and they keep looking for it, or they wanna do it maybe next to the, to the couch. So this might be actually very challenging to break. So we're gonna consider a protocol that we're slowly going to shape very small steps that bring the individual closer to the bathroom and closer to, to avoiding in the toilet. And we're going to reward every step that gets us closer to each, to the bathroom. And now gradual steps in this are key because if we go too fast, then the individual might resist and they might wanna hold their stool and so forth. So here's an example of a shaping routine for an individual who wants to have a bowel movement in his diaper and he wants to do it while standing behind the couch. As you can see, we have all of these steps and they're gonna start with him having a bowel movement in the diaper in front of the couch and we're gonna reward that. And then we're gonna move to the hallway, then we're gonna move to standing in the bathroom with his diaper, then sitting on the toilet um, with his diaper on. And as you can see, eventually the diaper comes off until we're successfully voiding with uh, the diaper on the toilet, which is what we want. And it's important to consider waiting three successful voids in each step before moving to the next one. 
And it's important that we're customizing and tailoring the needs of the individual and their routines into the protocol. Consequences. So what are consequences? It's usually a predetermined punishment that's delivered immediately after an accident has occurred. They're not always necessary and we're always gonna to wanna to try something less intrusive. So just repeating and practicing that correct and desired response before implementing a punishment strategy. So why are we considering a punishment? So with zero to two bowel movements a day, there are limited opportunities to teach the individual between a correct and an incorrect response. So adding a punishment procedure is gonna likely increase their ability to discriminate between those two responses. Taking into consideration their age and their skills, we might, we might realize that it's appropriate to do so. However, something as simple as having the consequence of the individual remaining in soiled underwear and after an accident may increase their ability to recognize when they're soiled and experience discomfort. If that's not the case, then here are some examples of some punishment strategies. The first one is overcorrection. So this basically consists of the individual cleaning or assisting with cleaning their own clothing after they have had an accident. Another one to consider is response cost. So this one's very, very simple. So it consists of taking away a privilege after immediately after having that accident. Now, if you're doing these punishment strategies, it's important to continue to positively reinforce that correct response, which is voiding in the toilet. We want to make that very clear distinction and provide that highly preferred item with praise for the correct responses. Some keys to success. So implementing the chosen intervention before deciding whether or not it's working for at least two weeks is recommended. Take notes or take data, whichever word you wanna use. Basically just write down, how is it going? Let's keep track of accidents, keep track of successful voids and see if the individual is making progress. The intervention should be flexible and customized to, eat, to each individual and being consistent is going to be key. So that was it for bowel movement toilet training. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague Tux and she's gonna to talk to you guys about overnight toilet training. Thank you, Kiara. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit further today about overnight toilet training. It's often synonymous with nighttime toilet training. So a brief introduction. Research on individuals with ASD and overnight toilet training within the field is limited. Specifically, a lot of the research focuses on reactive strategies. So after the individual is already engaging in bedwetting and not so much on the proactive side of things for planning and programming. Every protocol that you're going to hear today should be tailored and modified to your specific individual. And I wanna be transparent. Overnight toilet training is an intensive procedure. It can be difficult and it can take extended periods of time for true mastery. So be patient along the process. All of the strategies that I'm going to describe can be used across all age groups with adjustments based on age. So for your young learners, your teenagers, and for adults. So a little bit about the research that is in the field. Research supports that developmentally, children are successfully overnight toilet trained in elementary school, so around ages six or seven years old. So you wanna make sure that the expectations you're putting onto your individual and within your procedure are appropriate and realistic. You also wanna make sure that the quality of your reinforcer is potent. This is going to be extremely important in establishing that motivation for um, successful toilet training. I'm not going to give you a one size fit all procedure today. So you may need to think about combining and individualizing lots of different methods such as positive practice where you focus on the desired skill and have the individual repeat that skill. You may do some things such as guided compliance, practice trials, but using that reinforcement basis. As my colleague Brittany Rader mentioned in her presentation with daytime toilet training, it can be helpful to use a prerequisite checklist where you assess the skills that the individual has. If the individual doesn't have a specific skill in their repertoire, it may be helpful to take a step back and really focus on targeting that skill. For example, if the individual is unable to tolerate sitting on the toilet, it may be helpful to take that step back and really address that by building their tolerance. Where to get started. 
it can be a critical step to create some environmental adjustments as you individualize treatment, specifically limiting foods and drinks at least an hour before bedtime. You really want to increase that opportunity for a smooth transition to sleep because that's gonna be helpful for maintaining your schedule. You also may want to analyze some patterns of voids by taking that data or taking notes. So you may want to conduct some dry checks where you determine the window or the time frame that the individual can withhold throughout the night. It's also going to be critical to maintain a bedtime routine. So that way you can stick to the same schedule and your individual is clear of the expectations to transition to sleep. You may also need to determine some modifications as you individualize your protocol. And if something isn't working after a few weeks of trying it, it may be helpful to make some adjustments. Well, what does success look like? Success is when the individual is remaining dry throughout the night, able to independently use the toilet if they have the urge during the night, or requesting to use the bathroom with at least 80% independence. Ultimately, the goal is to achieve 100% success without having any accidents. Um, some potential barriers that you may experience on the road to success can be associated with problem behaviors associated with waking up in the middle of the night, such as tantruming or noncompliance. If this occurs, you may want to think about creating a less dense bathroom schedule at first and then working um, back up to a more frequent bathroom schedule. It may be helpful to really focus on establishing that maintained bedtime routine. And if the individual is experiencing having a tough time falling back to sleep, you may want to include some things in your procedure, such as white noise or dim lights or soothing music to help with that transition. Again, this process may be time consuming, so it's going to be really important that you have materials nearby, such as if the individual has an accident in the middle of the night, um, you don't want to extend the time they're awake, but you do want to have things nearby, such as a change of sheets, a change of clothing, maybe they need to take a warm bath, but you want to account for all of that. The way that you can address some of these problem behaviors, of course, if the problem behaviors you're experiencing are severe, you want to consult with a medical professional to rule out any medical concerns, or it may be helpful to also um, to talk with a BCBA or an OT or a PT, whichever um, professional you think is necessary. If your individual is engaging in such behaviors such as non-compliance with transitions, again, it may be helpful um, to reduce the frequency of your bathroom breaks. And it could be a critical thing to focus on transitioning from preferred and non-preferred activities during the day. So that way you can work on carryover to the nighttime toilet training. If the individual is engaging in tantrum behaviors, you may wanna consider how you're waking them up. Is it too abrupt? Maybe you need to do a gentle nudge and really consider your individual. You wanna make sure that that reinforcer is potent and visible so that motivation is established quickly. You want to follow through and potentially take some step back, some steps back to work on that bedtime routine to make sure that the individual is truly having a smooth transition to sleep. So when you wake them up, problem behaviors can be reduced. That bedtime routine. There's lots of things that you want to make sure that you include. And sometimes bedtime routining can be difficult, but you want to include some things like this. Making sure that um, dinner is occurring at least an hour or so before bedtime. And that means that they're finishing their dinner at least an hour or so before bed, which will increase that smooth transition to sleep. You may want to include things such as a bath or shower that can create some soothing effects for that transition to sleep. It's also gonna be helpful to reduce that screen time right before bed to increase that likelihood of the transition to sleep. It also could be helpful to review some expectations. So go over what to do in the bathroom, go over what to do if they have an urge in the middle of the night, it might be helpful to do like a bathroom trip right before bed. That will allow the individual to have some practice before they go to sleep and always be consistent with the time. If you set a bedtime for 9 p.m., try and make sure that that's the same time that the individual transition to sleep every night. Give me one second, sorry. Oh, there we go, oops, all right. So as the implementer, there's some preparation that you need to do. So you wanna make sure that you think about your tone and efforts as needed as the implementer. I know personally for myself, if I'm woken up in the middle of the night, I might be cranky or groggy, and that is not the way that I want to deliver cues and prompts. So you may need to consider that before you go and um, deliver your cues and prompts to your individual so that your, tune, your tone remains neutral. You also want to think about your schedule as the implementer. 
If you work overnight or you have an early rise the next morning, you may wanna consider creating a more flexible schedule in the time being so that you can truly dedicate the necessary time it's going to require to focus on overnight toilet training. This can be time consuming, so you wanna make sure to have all of your planned materials nearby. And we'll talk a little bit further about what those materials look like. As you create your schedule, you wanna start small. So you can set that hourly timer to assess for how long the individual remains dry. So this is trying to determine that window of time that the individual is able to withhold. You're trying to capture that window because that's going to be a critical component to determining the schedule for your bathroom breaks. It's gonna be important to take those notes, write down when the individual goes to bed, the time frame that they're able to withhold, the time of the accident, the time of the void, the time that they're truly asleep, and then as you begin to develop your plan, considering your materials, it may be helpful to conduct a preference assessment to ensure that your reinforcer quality is high and easily delivered. As my colleague Kiara mentioned, doing things like edibles could be a good place to start because it's quickly delivered and you won't need to remove it. You may also wanna consider things such as an adult pull-up or a nighttime pull-up, underwear is preferred, but you also wanna consider things such as wipes, change of sheets nearby, the timer for you as the implementer to determine the, bed, um, the uh, bathrooming schedule. You may want to consider things such as a urine wash indicator. Research supports that that can be helpful to some learners where it indicates the urge or it um, vibrates so that the learner knows to go and use the bathroom. Now that you've determined your schedule, you've figured out when you're gonna have your bathroom trips, you wanna set that timer so that you can wake the individual and prompt them to use the bathroom. You wanna make sure that you're including time for them to wake up. Sometimes it takes individuals a little bit longer to fully wake up and you wanna include that in your transition time. So maybe your initial schedule says that you're gonna wake them up at midnight, but in actuality, start the process around like 11.55. So you have enough time to transition them to the bathroom without them having an accident along the way. And as you develop the plan and you have your expectations in place, make sure that you're using the same expectations that you set for the daytime toilet training. If you have them sit during the day for two minutes, make sure that you're using that same time frame for the nighttime. It's going to be really important to use that carryover. And if the individual already has the skills of wipe, wiping, washing their hands in their repertoire, then you want to make sure that you include that in your overnight toileting procedure. Once the individual voids, again, give them that high quality reinforcer briefly and direct them back to sleep. Your goal is not for them to remain awake, but to transition right back to sleep. A helpful tip could be to keep the lights off or dim because you don't want to overstimulate them to staying awake too long. As you individualize your protocol, you want to think about your antecedent modifications. So you may want to consider what cue you're going to provide for the transition to the bathroom. It may look like something like time for the bathroom or time for the potty, depending on the age of your learner. You wanna consider the proximity to the bathroom at the appropriate or the approximate time of waiting. You also want to observe some of those precursor behaviors. So the individual may start fidgeting in their sleep and that may be an indicator that they need to use the bathroom. If you see the fidgeting in the sleep or if you notice that it's the scheduled time, you wanna transition them right to the bathroom. You may need to assist them with removal of clothing and sitting on the toilet as appropriate. And you wanna provide access to a leisure item while sitting on the toilet. Be considerate though that the, if you're going to give them a toy that you're not giving them something with loud noises or flashy lights. We're not trying to keep them awake for too long. We want them to finish through the process and go back to sleep. Um, you may have them sit for at least two minutes. And if the individual voids, you wanna provide them that predetermined reward and praise immediately. It can be helpful to have the item um, tucked away in the bathroom so that you can easily reach it. You may need to assist them with getting right up um, after they've voided so that they can complete the rest of the steps and you're gonna transition them right back to bed. This is a sample protocol. So you may do something where your bedtime routine is they have dinner at 7 p.m. Screen time is cut off at maybe like 7.15. Um, you give them a bath or a shower around 7.30. They put on their underwear or their adult pull-up. They read a book and lights are out by about 8.15. Now you're going to create your schedule where you wake them up once every three hours. So maybe for this individual, the plan time is 11.15, but it takes them a little bit to wake up. And so you go in at 11.10 and you start nudging them to wake up to transition to the bathroom. 
Um, you may have them um, exchange a PEC icon to request for the bathroom when the timer goes off, and you may cue them that it's time to use the bathroom. Now, let's say you get there and they've already had an accident. You want to immediately transition them to the bathroom, have them sit for that predetermined two minutes. You're not going to deliver your reinforcer. You're going to keep your tone neutral, so you're not going to be upset um, or let them know that you're upset. Um, and you're going, it, maybe it's included in your procedure already that they're going to do some overcorrection where they make the bed, they get dressed in dry clothing. You just want to consider that before you get started. If there wasn't an accident, you're going to continue to the bathroom, prompt them to sit on the toilet. They sit for two minutes, they're going to void. Maybe they already have these other skills in their repertoire where they can wipe, flush, and wash hands. You're going to give that um, reinforcer and you're going to transition them right back to bed. Again, this protocol can be used across all age groups with modifications um, maybe to your cue language. So maybe instead of time to use the bathroom, you're saying time for the potty. Um, you're going to consider your implementer prompting. So maybe you're having to use um, some gentle nudges um, for their hand towards the tissue or things like that um, and considering your schedule. So that's it for the overnight toilet training. I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, Tux. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about hygiene and wiping skills. So why is this an important life skill? Teaching these skills is obviously important for several reasons, including the development of personal privacy and independence with daily living skills. As many of you know, it's also important to reduce dependency on caregivers for daily living and for hygiene skills. In addition, wiping in particular can can impact an individual's general health and well-being, social development of social relationships, and obtaining and keeping a job, especially for adults. Okay, so what does success look like? We could say that an individual has mastered the skill of wiping if they can independently complete all the steps, meaning without any adult support, and thoroughly, meaning the bottom, is cleaned and thoroughly cleaned at least 80% of the time. Of course, and as my colleague said, ideally, and our ultimate goal is gonna be 100% of the time and across a wide variety of situations and settings. Typically developing children may not master this skill until age six or even later. However, this is just an average and many children start developing this, can start developing this skill sooner, even if the goal is not yet complete independence with the routine, so bear that in mind. So some barriers to success. As stated earlier, always consider skills in those four main areas, sensory concerns, behavioral concerns, language skills, and motor skills. Identifying any barriers in these areas can help you to plan your overall approach, including where to start and the strategies which are likely to be the most effective for the individual, whether, it's, whether you're teaching an eight-year-old child or a 43-year-old adult. Some examples of sensory barriers you might encounter might include not being able to tolerate different sensory stimuli related to feces, um, touching or, or smelling, being able to tolerate the feeling of toilet paper or the touch, or not tolerating the sound of the toilet flushing. Some exam examples of specific behavioral concerns related to wiping might be smearing feces or reaching into the toilet or shredding toilet paper. If you identify sensory or behavioral barriers such as these, you can plan for these needs when developing the individualized protocol, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You might need to go at a slower pace, incorporate extra or more powerful rewards, or make modifications to address these barriers. If the barriers are significant or extreme, always consult with a professional such as a behavior analyst or occupational therapist, possibly both, to determine the next steps as you'll likely need to target some of these barriers as prerequisites prior to starting teaching the wiping routine itself. Oops. Okay, so where to get started? Similar to what my colleagues shared earlier for bowel movement and overnight toileting, it will be important to take some information down and gather some information on what aspects of the wiping routine the individual can already do. So take some notes. Once we know this, plan for those barriers we identified just a minute ago. 
From there, now we'll be able to select the most appropriate teaching strategies to build our protocol and our plan, which we'll talk about more in just a couple slides. Finally, identify those rewards and reinforcers that will be used, which as Kiara and Tux have shared, this is a key component to success. These rewards will be most effective, again, if they're highly motivating, isolated to the skill that you're teaching and delivered immediately when you're focusing on a correct response that the individual performs. Okay, now let's start developing our plan. The first thing that you're going to wanna to do is create a task analysis. <clears throat> For those of you in the audience who may not be familiar with that term, a task analysis is really just a breakdown of a more complex behavior into its smaller steps. So here's an example of a task analysis for wiping. For example, step one, grasping the edge of the toilet paper and pulling slowly, wrapping the toilet paper around the hand twice and tearing off, reaching around and wiping front to back, looking at the toilet paper to see if it's clean or soiled, throwing that paper in the toilet bowl, and then depending on if it's clean or soiled, um, determining what to do next, whether starting over and, and getting more toilet paper to continue wiping, or if clean, flushing the toilet as a signal that you're all done. And we'll talk about some of those steps more. Um, now, just note that these steps in your task analysis can be broken down further. So this could look longer. They could be simplified or adjusted otherwise to tailor the steps based on the, the needs of the individual so that it works best for you and for the person that you're working with. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about <clears throat> two things. So teaching strategies outside the bathroom and inside the bathroom. The research on wiping skills specifically is fairly limited and most studies focus on other aspects of, of toileting skills or other daily living or related hygiene routines. The next couple of slides are just a summary of strategies that could be used both based on the evidence and the literature and practical, practical success based on our professional experience. All of these are evidence-based practices for individuals with ASD or related skills and that we're applying to the, to the skill of wiping here. So these first set of strategies are things that can be done outside of the bathroom when the individual has not yet actually had a bowel movement. An advantage to using these strategies includes increased practice opportunities as bowel movements may only occur once or twice a day at most. This also allows you to control when and where you're practicing and it can be a bit more low stakes if there are barriers. So what are some of those strategies? Social stories and video models can be used to review expectations and model the correct steps. There's also research to support that technology-based learning can be more preferred for individuals with autism. Discrimination training can help the individual learn to distinguish between different examples of clean or dirty. You could use pictures or short video clips of different examples with toilet paper or a doll, for example, using something like sun butter. Simulation training, this is really just practicing and role playing the steps of the actual wiping routine, which can be done again with a doll or even with a hard plastic item if you want to use something more neutral. Again, using sun, sun butter or something similar to simulate the experience. This allows you to target the same steps in the routine that will be used in the bathroom. A couple helpful tips here. There's research to support that incorporating an individual's favorite superhero or character from a TV show, video or pictures, in incorporating those into your materials can enhance the effectiveness and buy-in from the individual. And this will also help you customize the in intervention, whether it's a young child, teenager, or adult. Lastly, always ensure that any visual materials that you're using maintain the privacy and dignity for everyone involved. Never take pictures or recordings of anyone without clothing. Now I'll speak to some strategies that you can use while in the bathroom in context following a bowel movement. When we think about the task analysis or those list of steps that we talked about, we can start teaching from the first step, for example, grasping the toilet paper um, and adding one step at a time that way, or we could start teaching the individual from the last step, for example, flushing the toilet and building the routine backwards from the end. We could also teach all of the steps at once. In any of these cases, you wanna consider how any steps that you're not yet targeting or teaching will be addressed, most likely by the implementer doing them for the individual to maintain the routine. <clears throat> you wanna think about what's going to be easiest for you as the implementer and for the individual to be successful. Prompting. 
Consider whether you might use gestures or physical or point prompts or verbal prompts. If you're going to use verbal prompts, be mindful to limit the discussion and anything unrelated to the skill to fo really focus on the steps. Remember that the goal is eventually to fade yourself out and let the individual be independent. Visual supports, you could post visual schedules of steps or pictures of clean and dirty for the individual to reference. And audio cues can be used to teach the individual to say out loud, clean or dirty to label when looking at toilet paper to help them determine what to do next. Whatever language you're using, just be consistent. Also, if the individual maybe is non-vocal, you could also have the individual sign or point to a picture on the wall to reference instead of saying out loud, clean or dirty. Reinforcers, again, I'm not going to go into detail. Highly motivating rewards are gonna be helpful here. You wanna make sure that you know why you're delivering those rewards so that we're, we're rewarding the step or the components that we want to. Couple helpful tips here. If you're using visuals, be sure to teach the individual to quickly use or reference them and plan to fade them out. If you're using verbal prompts, don't get stuck where the individual is dependent on th these things. You wanna get rid of them as quickly as possible. Okay. So generalization training, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move fairly quickly through a couple of these slides. Um, so in this case, basically once the, the basics are mastered and learned, you wanna think about any other situations that might be necessary to, to demonstrate true independence. So for example, different variations in the home or community bathrooms, for example, um, in the school, if it's a younger child, the mall if it's a teenager, or possibly the bathroom at the individual's workplace if it's an adult to make sure that those common environments are also in the individual's repertoire. Okay, now let's talk about individual considerations for a moment. Again, you wanna get some information, uh, keep a log of what the individual can already do. Don't be scared by this if you're a parent or caregiver. Um, data can be whatever makes sense for you. Take a quick note on your smartphone, send yourself a text, keep a log or a journal, um, or you can even post something on the fridge. The take home point here is really to just gather information to help plan for and monitor your intervention. We've talked a lot about barriers. You also wanna consider location, different types of materials you could use, um, different positioning when using the bathroom and wiping and possibly modifications such as rules or different ways of actually um, manipulating the toilet paper and wiping that are gonna fit the individual. So here's a sample protocol that you can use if the main issue or the main barrier that you're working on with the individual is problem behavior. <clears throat> Starting outside the bathroom might be a good way to start in this case. Using those activities and strategies that I mentioned, such as social stories, video models, practice, and role play. Starting here can help you make the routine more successful during a lower stakes time. And you'll wanna use those same rewards and reinforcers to really reward that participation, even if it doesn't seem necessary. Using powerful rewards that are only available during this routine will really help with motivation and build a, positive, a history of positive consequences as a foundation to build on. Once the individual is successfully participating in looking at videos or stories, following instructions with pictures or dolls, then you could move to simulation and role play training to practice outside the bathroom with doll or other items. Again, help and reinforce. Finally, once the individual is no longer engaging in problem behavior during practice, you can start to transfer the routine into the bathroom in practice, um, and then again in context after a bowel movement. So that's one example of a sample protocol. Here's another example that you could use in the bathroom, which is really looking at building the routine from the beginning of the routine all the way through the end, where you may just start with step one, grasping the edge of the toilet paper and pulling, reinforce that step. And once the individual learns how to do that independently, you can really build systematically from steps one to two, then adding in step three and so on, all the way through the end of the routine. You could also start backwards, start at the end of the routine and work backwards. Again, just be sure that any steps that are not being taught are completed and modeled by the implementer. So I'm gonna pause there and now we're just gonna take a moment to do some wrap up and then leave a few minutes for some questions at the end from the audience. So what are some things that you all in the audience can do right now? 
Regardless of whether you want to work on bowel movement toileting, nighttime toileting, or wiping skills, here are some, some tips to get you started. Establishing the routine. Think about reviewing the steps for the bathroom before bed, scheduling a bathroom trip before bed, reviewing those expectations before using the bathroom, or modeling the correct sequence for wiping when helping. Accept and praise any existing appropriate behaviors the individual is already doing. We wanna make sure these toileting routines are preferred and prevent the development of negative patterns or avoidance behaviors. This can also build a history of positive consequences and help to serve, uh, help you to recognize what the individual's already doing. It also helps to maintain those aspects of the routine the individual's doing so that we don't lose that over time. Reinforce any new successes. So this, this could be considered like catch them when they're good strategy. Um, where if you see anything better than you normally see, take the opportunity to re reward this and hopefully increase the likelihood that they'll do this again in the future. For example, the individual may happen to remain dry throughout the night, have a bowel movement near the bathroom door, or maybe they reach for the toilet paper independently after a bowel movement. Take that opportunity to reward it immediately, but don't ask for anything more. Sometimes this can backfire. Instead, just help them finish the routine and make it go as smoothly and easily as possible to end on a good note. That said, don't be discouraged if these bonus behaviors, so to speak, don't happen consistently. That's okay and it doesn't mean there's anything wrong. You're just still setting the foundation for when you're actually ready to tackle these more thoroughly. And last, consult with professionals. We know tackling these skills can be overwhelming and often challenging, and you may be unsure where to start. Bowel movement training, nighttime training, and wiping are also more complex than initial toilet training. Because of this, we always recommend consulting with professionals such as behavior analysts, occupational therapists, or both to help guide you. And finally, just a few takeaway points to kind of summarize and wrap up. Consult with a doctor to address any medical concerns. Plan ahead and consider your materials that you as the implementer are ready. Be consistent, try and, and plan for two weeks before making any major changes or modifications and be flexible to go slowly if needed or over time to adjust. This might take several months up to a year even to acquire these skills fully. Prioritize, select one behavior at a time and really make it as easy as possible for the individual to learn that so that it goes well. Again, collect your data, don't be afraid of this, do whatever works for you, and it's okay if it's not perfect. It's just important to jot down notes before and during the intervention. Use those powerful rewards, stay focused, and plan for those barriers. And that is really it. Now we wanted to kind of stop there and leave a few minutes at the end for some questions from, from you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a terrific presentation. Lots of information uh, presented there. One of the questions um, that just came across the chat box, if the child is used to going to bed with a pull-up, should you wean them off of that during the process or at once? Okay, that was a great question. Um, it really depends on the individual, but I would say that underwear of course is preferred. Um, I think a good place to start would be to slowly get to a place where maybe out of the seven days a week, you're doing six days a week without a pull-up and you're doing underwear, then five days a week and kind of working back like that. So just taking your time through the process, you wouldn't want to make a huge adjustment in the middle of a complex training. Uh, another question uh, that's in the chat box. My son is only doing bowel movements in his diaper at nap time and or nighttime when he is three, for instance. Uh, should I wake him uh, as a night training or shift sleeping times? I believe he only feels comfortable enough to release it while sleeping. It's not a true reluctance. And thank you. Hi, um, that's a great question as well. So given that he's having only his bowel movements during sleep, it might be a little bit more challenging and a little bit of a barrier to get started because you might not really see some of those precursor behaviors that we've identified during the day. So you might not see that straining or you not might see that um, trying to, to avoid in his diaper. So maybe waiting until he's a little older, until he's having those bowel movements during the day. And you can also consult a professional with this because it is a bit of a barrier to get started with bowel movement training. 
Uh, one of the questions, and I'm not sure if this is something I, you know, that, that can be shared and I can send it out or, or not. Uh, lots of good tips on the internet. Is there a good visual slash steps to guide a child visually, something to print out and possibly put in the bathroom? Are there any sites you recommend or do you have something that you have used or, or suggest? Yeah, that might be um, what we could, maybe what we could do is uh, put together a couple of quick links, but yeah, there's definitely lots of resources out there and available on the internet or you could make something yourself um, and we could share a couple of suggestions with you, Neil, afterwards. Okay, great. Uh, and if there's some links that I have, I'll make sure to include them uh, in the email uh, that I put out that it in includes usually a survey monkey link. Um, as well as usually the recorded YouTube video of today's presentation. Uh, to begin bowel movement training, I should make sure the language is correct. Right now he says poo poo on the potty when he really needs urination as his prompt that he needs to go. So is there a, uh, the use of language, does that come into it as well? Is that an important thing? Hi, Sharon, I see your question and it's also a great question. So I wouldn't necessarily focus that he's saying the correct thing. Um, as a matter of fact, he doesn't need to really be requesting to have a bowel movement. You can start before he's saying that and you can still prompt him to say pee pee, for example, um, instead of saying poo poo, but I wouldn't focus on the language um, before getting started. Great. Um, we have one question about nighttime wedding. I know that wasn't part of this uh, presentation, but if you could, if, if there's some thoughts on this, uh, it's my understanding you want the individual to learn how to wake up when they experience the urge, um, in order for that to happen, they have to be awoken at the first sign of wedding, like with an alarm or things like that. Um, uh, they've tried for years on a teenage son without success. Um, uh, the, the child doesn't particularly, isn't particularly reward driven, hard to motivate uh, and hard to get them to comply using an alarm. Um, what are your thoughts on sort of the alarm training? So again, a really good question. Um, this is a lot more specific and it seems like there's a lot of components involved. In this type of a situation, I would definitely recommend consulting with your medical professional to rule out if there's any medical concerns, especially if you've tried for years. Um, and I think your doctor would be able to assist you with what is going to be the best alarm. There's lots of different options out there. Um, and that is a specific tool that I really think should be individualized for the individual. It shouldn't be you can't just pick a random one. I think it's going to be helpful to consult with someone first. Okay. Uh, another question that just came into the chat box, an adult which has taken a long time to get toilet trained uses a medical toilet uh, in their room. Any tips to transfer them sort of going back to a hall bathroom without moving backwards? Most all steps are mastered uh, except for wiping. Yara, that might be a question best for you, yeah. I'll go, I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, hi, Tammy. So something that you might try to consider is shaping that. So you might slowly start um, so smaller, simple steps to move that, to go ahead and, and move where the toilet is in the, in the meantime. I would still consult with a professional, but you can consider breaking down the steps for the location to get him a little bit more closer to the bathroom. Uh, how can I get my six-year-old to use the bathroom independently without reminding or using verbal prompts? So there's a lot of strategies that you could use. Um, some options, some simple ones that you could try could be using a timer that you teach your child to um, control themselves, or at least to stop with some sort of visual to prompt them to go to the bathroom, or possibly a watch that has a timer, and then over time you could fade that out. Um, if those things aren't successful, I would probably, we would probably suggest consulting with a professional though to help. Um, that's the last one I have in the chat box. Uh, I'm glad you guys covered the sensory piece because for my son, uh, when he was little and we were going through this, it was really a sensory thing. So it was finding some of those things to overcome the, the sensory barriers. So um, getting him used to the sound of the toilet flushing or, or things like that. Uh, was a big step for him. And I think one of the things that really helped my younger son was sort of role playing it like you all suggested, but also he had an older brother that he, we would make such a big party out of my older son going to the bathroom, even though he was already successful toilet training, my little one wanted the same thing. So it was like, well, if you want the, the, the poop party, we called it, 
um, you're going to have to sort of get to where he is. And that was sort of his motivation for that. So I think that role playing piece and, you know, um, celebrating the successes is such a great thing. So I don't see any other questions popping up uh, in the chat box. Uh, I want to thank again uh, our presenters today from Behavioral Framework, uh, our, our, the Associate Clinical Directors, Lewis and Tux uh, and Chiara. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out today. It's a very important topic. Keep your eyes open on your email for uh, the survey because the survey helps us uh, plan future presentations and, um, and, and topics uh, and look for the YouTube link to the presentation as well. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you guys for coming out to present today. Uh, it's such an important topic and it was definitely one we had a lot of requests for. So thank you again uh, and thank you to Behavioral Framework and thank you to everyone who attended and uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Stay safe, everyone. Everyone.